So we're here tonight to talk about Parallels and Rupture. That's the show that's in the main gallery in the Friedman. You guys are all welcome to calm down, um, have some great food. There's gonna be some yummy um, treats after this down in the gallery. Um, so the reception is tonight from five to seven. You'll also be able to see the exhibit um, by Lisa Nanny in the project space. That's the neon show. And um, there's also a video that's screening in the foyer gallery on um, Mitch McLaughlin's Forever. Um, so those are um, a couple of other great things to um, take in tonight if you go down to the gallery besides the art that you're going to see um, here shortly. Uh, <clears throat> a couple of other things to know. Um, to know. We do have an event um, that has still kind of been in the planning stages. It looks like it's going to be on October 5th, um, and that will be a complement to Parallels and Rupture. So you'll hear more about that in the coming weeks, but that event is going to be with Danny Simmons, who's one of the original founders um, of Deaf Jam Poetry, and so we are going to do a deaf, um, or we're going to do a poetry event here on campus, um, and that will kick off um, what we call empowering all right voices. Um, so look for more information about that. Um, uh, Simone in the English department is going to um, be part of that, Dr. Banks, and then um, some students will be part of that. So it should be a really exciting event. Um, also, um, the two shows that I mentioned before, Lisa Nanny and um, Mitch McLaughlin, those end on October 13th, but this actually goes through December uh, 8th in the main gallery. So you've got some time to see it, but I encourage you to come down and see it tonight. Um, when you'll be able to talk to Matt, I believe there's going to be at least a, an artist or two there that are in the show. That's exciting as well. Um, so you'll be able to, to meet some of the artists and things like that. And <coughs> yummy refreshments. And yummy refreshments, exactly. Um, all right, so um, if you're wondering where to find out more information, including things like when is the next theater show, which just comes up at the end of the month, grab one of these. These are all over the CFA, so outside, things like that. This is the um, Season Magazine. It's going to tell you everything that's happening in music, art, fashion, theater, as well as all the lectures that happen annually on campus. Um, it'll tell you what's an experience event, exactly where it's going to be, what date, all the way into spring. So you definitely want to grab one of these. These are also available online on the website. You can download that, everything. Okay. Um, we do have a couple other pu publications that if you want more information, the gallery usually publishes some type of um, trifold or catalog for each show. This is the one for the Foyer Gallery show, um, the Forever Show by Mitch McLaughlin. We will have one coming with Lisa Nanny. And there'll be a full color um, <laughs> publication, a, a full color catalog that will be developed for um, Parallels and Rupture. But that'll probably come um, more towards the end because we're just starting to work on that now. Um, all right, so uh, enough with the announcements. Let me get some thank yous in here. I want to start off by thanking, first of all, the artists. And you're going to hear more about the extensive artist list here from Matt. Uh, from Professor Garrison, but I also want to thank the team that put the exhibit together. So that included Rich, uh, How, Kate Mishricki, um, Abby Lutero, Kara Johnson down in the main office, our CFA assistant, and all the folks really who work in the CFA. Um, that includes our AV tech staff, so Stephen and John, um, all of our gallery attendants, Dr. Pancrafts for coming to do the photographs, our other campus partners like communications, facilities, food service, the experience program. Also want to thank our visual arts committee. They're the group that helps us along with our donors to put these exhibits together. Um, they make recommendations on acquisitions to the collection, all of that kind of stuff. And we have several of our uh, visual arts committee members here today. So thank you guys as well. Um, and then finally, um, and certainly not by any means last because uh, of any reason other than they are really the most important person. I want to thank Matt Harrison. So this um, exhibit is really his creation, it's his vision. Matt is a professor of art and digital media. Um, he served as the guest curator for this show. He holds an MFA from Hunter College, um, City University of New York, and his Bachelor of Fine Arts from RISD, uh, so the Rhode Island School of Design, where he um, also was part of the European Honors Program.
First and foremost, Matt is an artist. He's had many solo and group shows across the world. Um, he also is an essayist and a critic, serving to write um, articles and reviews for other shows. And then he is also a curator, and that's what he's here to talk about tonight, um, what goes into researching and to putting together an exhibition. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to our esteemed guest <laughs> curator, Matt Garrison. Yeah, well, th thank you very much, David. That's uh, very appreciated. So yeah, this is Parallels and Rupture, and I have my own thank yous as well. So I put them up here so I don't forget. Uh, David, of course, who makes this possible. He's been a supporter of this from when it was proposed a year ago, and has always been there to uh, help facilitate everything. So thank you very much for that. Rich Hawk, who uh, is essential in getting this show up and uh, was especially helpful in creating the room for Marilyn Minter's video downstairs. So that's an incredible, I'm, I'm very grateful for that. Kate Mishriki, who just keeps me in line <laughs> because she makes sure everything is lined up for insurance and the work arrives safely and uh, is essential. Even Nicodemus back there, who makes everything else happen with the electronics and uh, capturing all of this and for social media. Abby Platero, who is just always there to help with everything that's needed. And of course, Dr. Pankratz, who uh, has uh, been extremely uh, generous in his photography and has captured some wonderful images of the show that I've heard from artists and, and everyone is very grateful for that. So thank you everyone. Many of the photos you'll see tonight are Dr. Pankratz's photos. All right, so where did this show begin? It started out with a pretty straightforward idea and then it started to expand and the idea came simply from uh, something that uh, an artist, Philip Gustin, kind of sprung on the New York art world in 1970 at the Marlboro Gallery. Uh, he was known for doing more abstract expressionist type work and was really recognized and, and really excellent uh, working in that vein. And then in 1970, he had this show which just threw everybody off. <laughs> and he basically presented all these characters. They felt, like, they felt like they came out of underground comic books. And it just was received uh, either with one extreme or the other. And here, I'll just read quickly what, was, what Mr. Gustin uh, wrote about the exhibition. When these were shown, my painter friends in the New York school would come up to me and say, now, what did you do that for? It seemed to depress a lot of people. It was as though I had left the church. I was excommunicated for a while. At the opening, he, meaning William de Kooning, a, a very established uh, painter, abstract expressionist, uh, grabbed me, hugged me, and said he was envious, which was flattering because I regarded him as the best painter in the country, and in many ways, the only one. I mean, he's a real mind and a real painter. Philip, he said, this isn't the subject. Do you know what the real subject is? And we both said at the same time, freedom. Then we hugged each other again. Of course, that is what it's about, freedom. That's the only possession the artist has, freedom to do whatever he can imagine. So I thought that was a, a good place to start where artists who are known for one thing, they always have kind of a parallel body of work happening in their studio. And then every once in a while that emerges, and it might be a complete rupture like Philip Gustin and they go in a completely different way, or in the case of, for example, Peter Coyne, uh, the photograph up here, she's had photography shows and as you'll see, she's known as a sculptor. And Catherine Lee, who's an established sculptor as well, uh, has incorporated poetry into her work. Joel Carrero had 
years of doing these sort of beautiful, delicate uh, mosaics of collage, and then suddenly he started to deconstruct Picasso. And down here, Judith Shea, an established sculptor again, and we have some uh, photography of hers from 1976, so some really early work, which is very exciting. Paul Andretti, who studied sculpture, uh, went on to become a painter. And then over here we have Creighton Michael at, on the end, and he really works across a number of different materials and media, sort of the hand and technology and that sort of thing. But then I started to think about parallels and rupture and what that could mean, those two words, and the definition started to expand. So I decided to embrace my own concept and give myself the freedom to kind of expand those definitions as well. And then I thought, well, we're in this incredible moment right now where people are reassessing art history and looking back at uh, the linear notion of art history and saying, well, where is everybody? Where is the multicultural international perspective? And where are the women, right? There are always a few, but, they're, they, but predominantly it's white men, right? When you look at your art history books. And I was looking at my, my art history book, uh, the uh, Janssen art history book, which many people would have had uh, back in the day. No Diego Rivera, no Romer Bearden, no Frida Kahlo. It's like really essential artists were just not even there. This is that reassessment of art history with people like Danny Simmons, Willie Cole here, Marilyn Minter, uh, Sarah Jimenez, Anna Perezzi, and Korea Atkins. So again, just that expansion of what parallels, for example, um, someone like Danny Simmons and Willie Cole, they've kind of worked alongside the mainstream of, of art history and recently have started to break through. So that's really exciting to see. And then finally, there was societal rupture. And in this case, you know, there are moments in history, and of course I can't include everything, like the Great Depression and the World War II and the Vietnam War, but I did touch upon a few recent events that hopefully will open up that conversation that could include other artists and, and other ideas. So here we have uh, Alex Golden up at the left, and we'll talk about this more, but uh, his work deals with the AIDS epidemic in the 80s. Uh, this piece here by the Jeju Island Collective deals with or addresses just this, the anxiety in general terms, and they create this, these over-the-top performances to protect themselves from everything they can imagine. Seng Quan Chi over here, he was something, he considered himself an ambassador, but also he was someone who sort of, po he was a Hong Kong artist living in New York, and he took on the role of this diplomat <laughs> from China and would pose in front of these iconic buildings. And then I think it's really powerful to have him in the context of Judith Shea, and Judith Shea again and Susan Cryle, who are dealing directly with 9-11. So when you go to the gallery, you'll see those three pieces next to each other. And I think it's a really powerful uh, suite of, of images. And then over here we have Jennifer Markowitz, and she's thinking about the recent COVID pandemic that we've all encountered. And she took her government check and turned it into an embroidered mask over there. So these are all the ideas behind it. Then I started to think, well, even though that's kind of where I was placing them in my mind, as the show came together, they really could fall into any other, any other category that's here and even others that you might think of yourself. And that's what I was hoping for when I brought the work together in the gallery, that 
this conversation that would take place would open up ideas. And if I were to take each one of these and do them as a separate exhibition, I don't think that opportunity would be there to see uh, how they relate to one another and that things do happen simultaneously rather than in a linear way, more of a mosaic than a, a thread. Now, my compass for this show was Romare Bearden, and I was really thrilled to find that Albright College has some significant Romare Bearden in their collection, uh, including these two pieces that are in the exhibition downstairs, the train here and pilot over there. And he, in my mind, kind of fit into all these different categories. Born in 1911, he grew up alongside modernism, saw all the artists from World War II come here to the US uh, and watched pop and minimalism and abstract expression, that whole linear idea. In the meantime, he's working with a number of other artists in Harlem on this kind of parallel track, right? And so there's, there's this incredible sort of connection between uh, Bearden and some of these other ideas. So one of the things that caught my attention, it's hard to see, but here we, it says working proof, go ahead. And I was looking at Bearden's sketchbooks, and I thought, that really looks like his handwriting. So even though the piece is not signed, I'm pretty sure he wrote working proof, go ahead, in the bottom, right? If you look at the W, if you look at your W here, right, it's the same W. The O, very similar, again, Another page from his sketchbook, the EA over here, the O, and then that's a very specific kind of F in fiction, and it's the same F there for proof. So, you know, a handwriting analysis analyst could maybe confirm it, but it seems to me that Romare Bearden wrote that in the corner of our print. This piece is called The Train. From 1974, as you can see. And trains were a theme in Bearden's work. And this idea of travel or journey is in a number of artists' work that you'll see shortly. Does anyone see the train in the piece? There is a train right there through the window. So we have a train, and this was a theme in his work because when he was young, his family migrated from North Carolina to Harlem. And then, of course, there's the Great Migration and the Underground Railroad. So this idea of movement of people is thematic in his work and some of the other artists' work as well. And then we have here Pilot. Now, this was really exciting because it's actually a pretty important print. It's in this book. So I was excited to, to see that. And some people may know Pilate from the Bible, right? There's a, a figure from, named Pilate. But in fact, this is based on Toni Morrison's Song of Solomon, the character in that novel. And so what I found is that Toni Morrison did, in fact, reference this print specifically in the book here. Uh, and so I'll read uh, more Toni Morrison's thoughts on this. Imagine my surprise at what he saw, things I hadn't seen or known when I invented her, what he made of her earring, her hat, and her bag of bones, far beyond my word-bound description, heavy with the life that both energized and muted her, solitary, daring, anyone to deprive her of her symbols, her history, her purpose. I had seen her determination, her wisdom, and her seductive eccentricity, but not the ferocity he saw and rendered. So a really powerful and beautiful um, meeting of artists and visions. Uh, so that I thought that was a really exciting and surprising discovery in my research. And the other thing that 
we'll see is that both in this piece and this piece, um, there are references directly to African art. For example, certainly the textiles here, which we'll see in Danny Simmons' work later, and also in Willie Cole's work, which is downstairs, we have his domestic shield 15 on the left and the smile that bites on the right. And he works with uh, found objects very often, and he incorporates the history of the object into his own personal history. Both his mother and uh, grandmother were housekeepers. So uh, you can see that in his work, uh, as well as when he, was a, when he was young, growing up in Nork, he was seeing uh, African art, and Romare Bearden was something of an expert on African art as well, and has written about it. And certainly the masks of Africa, and here the shields and the forms are evident in, in these pieces. Also in uh, Willie Cole's work is this wonderful humor. Right, we have Shunufu female figure, uh, and of course it's uh, it's based on the Sanufo uh, people in Africa. But he's found this wonderful way of kind of combining shoes and this notion of bronze shoes and that kind of thing in this piece. And I just thought it would be interesting to compare. The two. So here we have a, San, a Sanufo figure on the left, and then we can see his uh, shoes there. So it's kind of wonderful. You can see the breasts there are replicated over here, right? So really some terrific, and the face is kind of picked up as well. So just some really great sort of connections between the figures and these found objects that Willie Cole works with. And then I was like, where is this Sanufo region? And that's the great thing about working with all these artists with all their different perspectives. I learned a lot. And so here it is. Uh, it kind of filters. There's some in the Ivory Coast, in Mali, Ghana, Burkina Faso. So they're kind of spread across a few different countries. Another artist who works with these African themes is Danny Simmons, and he is a creative tour de force. He's a poet, as uh, David had mentioned. Da Whoop. <laughs> He's a, a poet, as David Hanner mentioned. He runs a gallery in Philadelphia. He's a gallerist, um, and he's a, an, uh, an extraordinary painter of multimedia. And you can see he combines these fabrics, both contemporary fabrics with African fabrics. And here's an example of that. And you can see how they come together in this kind of wonderful kaleidoscopic cultural collision. So I point out this one especially in the upper left corner here because that is a, a a fabric from Ghana, and it has its own definition here, a willing helper. It's a symbol for willing helper. And also blue is a color in Ghana that's often associated with funerals. And uh, Danny Simmons is a very generous person as well with his gallery and given providing opportunities for artists in Philadelphia. Here's one of his poems. Now, you really need to be here on October 5th because he can read the poem. <laughs> uh, but I will just read this, this low, the, from the, the lower part. I had typed it, and I th thought, no, that doesn't recall the way he laid out the typography in the book. So I just used the book here. So I'll just start from poised. Poised, still, and breathless, we stand on the shoulders of our ancestors offering timeless ritual across the bloodied ocean, we bring you with us on yet another journey. So really beautiful and powerful words. And when I see this, I just see that journey and that tension and those questions of home. Uh, these pieces are 
homeward bound on the left, take the long way home, and whole lot of blues on the right. So there is this theme of where is home? And there's a tension there between the fabrics and the culture and the, the pigment and the color. And it's just a really sort of exciting and fascinating uh, piece to consider. And he does consider this a triptych. So he sees this as, as one piece. Here's uh, Turia Adkins. And this also recalls the Great Migration. And she's based in New York. Many of the artists are based in New York. Danny Simmons is a Philadelphia artist. We have a North Carolina and a Texas artist. So, uh, but, quite a, but she's a New York artist. And in this work, she collages these running figures, track, these black figures in track and field. And what I really love about this piece is they all come from different moments in the race, right? Some are sprinting. Some are obviously in a long distance race. Some seem to be approaching the finish line. And even though they share the same space, they all seem to be in their own sort of personal com uh, contest. And I think there's something really great about that, the individuals together striving in their own way. And then here we have Peter Coyne's photograph. And again, the movement of people. In this case, uh, these are monks from Koyasan, Japan. And uh, Peter Coyne, she would wake up in the morning when these monks would do this sort of running meditation as the sun was rising, and she would photograph and run alongside them. And they were totally okay with it. They, were happy. they, were, they didn't mind at all. And she came back with these wonderful, and please note, silver gelatin print, 40 by 60 inches, not a digital print. So that's a pretty remarkable piece. But what I love about these is it's a different kind of movement. There's something ephemeral. And even though there's a spirituality across a lot of the work that we've been uh, looking at, this, is a, this spirituality seems to be very, very internal somehow, sort of between internal and external realms. And this is the work that maybe she's known for, right? She does these wonderful hanging wax sculpture that are huge, and even though they look maybe weightless, they're quite heavy. <laughs> and then on the right, she would wrap these figures in taxidermy and, and hair. And what happens here is everything is very still, right? Everything's kind of encased and reflective and, and thoughtful, and it's very internal. But when we get to this, things are in motion. So there's, some, there's a different sense of movement uh, in both of these. But I think in both pieces, there's a certain reverence as well. Then we have, uh, I'm going a little bit quickly because you may have questions and things like that. And there's a lot of artists. Uh, then we have uh, Catherine Lee. And here she's presented, again, poems. So there's a theme of poetry in the exhibition. and and these, she's, they're her own poems. And each one is a Raku ceramic clay piece. And they're stamped into these. And for me, they feel ancient somehow, almost like a Rosetta Stone type tablet. Uh, yet they're her own personal reflection, reflections and dealing with loss and coming to terms with these transitional, these transitions in life. And one of the things that I think is kind of beautiful about these is it's almost like the wire. When you see a tree grow around a bicycle or a fence, it sometimes gets squeezed and then opens up again. Uh, I feel like that's happening in these, and it gives a sense of the passage of time as well. And then this is a, her, and you can hear her reading her poems downstairs. So. Uh, do take a moment and just listen and look as you are when you're down there. But here she is reading one of her tablets. Them dinosaurs, they still rule this earth. 
break feathered reptiles in viridian green, or break them unfathoming. Great red ogred flanks lie under lakes, plains, valleys, bright cerulean blue crowns, and steely mandibles unnashing, zinc black eyes unblinking, yellow cat throats and clawed bony feet. All are settled now into vast pools, the blackest of sumi inks. We are them in our way, only naked and plain, and littler but mean, just ripe to fall. Pretty powerful. And there's a real sort of courage in her work, I feel, because she just really puts herself out there. Another artist is Judith Shea. And here I see her as a kind of pioneer. She was really ahead of a number of artists. Here she's working with, with the idea of a snow coat. And what this is, is it's a coat that's folded like this, right? And no one was really doing this at the time. In, in the 1970s, you had, again, that, all that, the, that sort of linear emphasis on maybe minimalism or pop or some of these other things. She studied fashion at Parsons, and she took that knowledge and applied it to sculpture. And you will see a number of artists creating costumes and creative outfits, but those were to be worn. This was garment as sculpture. So it's something to be considered. And uh, the, the meaning of the garment itself and its structure and its presence are all part of the work. Now, this is from 1977. We have here, from 1976, a series of photographs. And here is that coat again. Uh, this time, you can see a different sort of form from it. And we have here this figurative work where you have this combination of the geometry of the fan with the form of the figure, and then also the fabric and how the three relate. And I always sort of think of these as a, a caryatid column, right? Where you have the figures and you see those maybe in Athens. So it, I feel like there's always something kind of sculptural emerging from her work. And these are really the origins of the work that she did later, right? In the 80s, this is at the Walker Art Center, where the figure is absent, but again, the garment is present, right? And then this is a, her more recent work, where she created these pieces to honor women artists, and in this case, it's um, Louise Bourgeois. Another artist in the exhibition is Anna Parisi. And she is a Brazilian artist. And this is, um, I think, a really beautiful piece. It's a collage. So again, you have fabric here in the lower part making up the, the clothing. And then she's holding a Adoma trigon which is a stingray found in Brazil in the, in the rivers. And it's a really this sort of, I see it as this loop between nature and humanity. And also in, in Brazil, there's candomblé. It's a religion of the people where they, where they connect to sort of the natural environment and, and the priests, for example, have those dots on them. And also, the stingray has those dots. So you see, again, that circuit between the nature and the people and the culture of Brazil. Now, Anna Parisi is also willing to take on really tough topics. So she interviewed people who were raped. And this is one of the quotes from that interview. And she explains that uh, the whole thing with the opacity of the paper and the distance between the truth and the pain and the words and the figure is meant to convey the distancing p 
people take when engaging with the subject of rape and trans issues. They see it, but they just can't truly empathize. So that's kind of where that's coming from. So this creates, you can, you can see it, but there's, there's, a, there's a distance between the figure and the experience and then the, the rest of the world. Here's Mahler Ryder's work. And again, you can see this is from 1971. He was a contemporary of Romare Bearden. And so he's coming of age in Harlem, living in Harlem. And here he has a drawing of, with pen and ink, beautiful, great detail, uh, very fine lines of these people on the subway. And also, I like to see the strap hanger here, he's holding the subway handle, but it also recalls maybe a black power movement fist, right? So there is, a, uh, there is meaning within meaning and ideas within ideas here. And also about this time, Mahler Ryder was one of the original founders of the Harlem Museum, and he was their first secretary. A later piece of his, is this one, and this is called The Birdman, and he did a series in the 80s, uh, and he passed away in 1995. So, but in the 80s, the last work that he was doing were these assemblages uh, related to jazz. He was a, a jazz pianist, and so really understood the improvisation and the complexities of the music, and was trying to bring those that those ideas into painting. So you have, again, almost like the rhythm of the red and then the improvisation of the pigment and the paint and the form. Another artist is Paul Andretti, and he started out as a sculptor. So the earlier piece is the sponge with his, his teeth. And then he eventually... Uh, began to paint. And these are enamel, this is enamel car paint on a, on a wood panel. And he thinks of these again as color chords. He's thinking of music and responding to music uh, as he's painting this piece. And over here, I just love how visceral those two materials are when they combine, right? Something that's often kind of associated with cleanliness and cleaning and house cleaning, and then, of course, something associated with chewing and, <laughs> and the mouth. So it's just there's something really great when those two things combine. There they are in the show. All right, and then this is Joel Carrero's work. And he, this is the work that he's best known for. And as you may recall, I mentioned that he did these beautiful mosaics. And in some ways, I think he's anticipating our moment in these pieces and that he's looking back at art history and taking elements from all different times in history and combining them into these patterns that have almost like a map-like quality to them. Right? I feel like I'm almost looking at a map of art history as I look at these with coastal lines and, and different terrain uh, in the work. And then, yeah, suddenly and abruptly, and I'll just jump over here, he started doing these Picassoid pieces where these were made from a heat transfer onto birch panel. This is actually finding books on Picasso, cutting out the pages, and punching holes into it, and layering it. And then what happens is you get a familiarity, like I kind of recognize Picasso's style, but I may or may not know that specific piece. And the same thing happens on the image behind it, and then the image behind that. So there's this excavation or archaeology that takes place when looking at these, that you're starting to assemble the history, not side by side here, but layered one on top of the other. 
Then we have Creighton Michael, and he, he is very much a multimedia artist. And I chose this work because for me, it embodies this rupture and in, in moment. He's of that generation that grew up, like some of us, in the analog age, listening to records and cassettes in the radio. And then he adapted to and adopted uh, the digital world in his work. So he lives in two worlds. And that it's a really, I think it's a really precious generation that is finite. Right, so uh, he for me embodies that, and what he did is he took these earlier drawings from 2011 pigment uh, motion capture archival pigment print, and he reassembled them by hand here, and then he had computer software kind of glitch it and reinterpret it here, and he organized them in such a way that you have this combination of the computer and the digital world with the hand and the way of kind of looking at things in that more sort of personal and improvisational way. Sarah Jimenez is from the Philippines, and this piece, The Borders Between Our Bodies and the Rest of the Universe, it's a large piece. You get a sense of that uh, from the photograph. Uh, and what she does, uh, she addresses things like marginalized histories, abandoned objects, textiles. And she, in this case, you can see she's taken colonial photos and, and kind of collaged them into this dense, fence-like form. And I feel like I could enter that world, but it would be, uh, there's a struggle that's happening, right? Because you have to kind of push through and work your way through as opposed with, for example, maybe just as here I could sort of float into that space. This space is a very different experience. And the red form, which is, is very vibrant, and you can see here sort of the intensity of the texture in the work, that sort of vibrancy against the darkness and the unknown uh, in this piece. Here we have Margaret Meehan. So when you're inside, don't forget to look up because this to me is like a banner uh, that's a declaration for the exhibition, deeds, not words, so action. And you can see that in the artists throughout the show, their action is the act of creation and putting their ideas out there into the world. This is her other work. She does this beautiful sort of whimsical ceramics work. So, and these are all bird figures over there. So you can see she has a, a wonderful sense of humor, but also a really edgy sense of humor. She's always pushing at the boundaries, trying to get uh, people to think and reflect and to act. So deeds, not words. This piece I mentioned earlier, and this is the Jeju Island Collective, uh, Radical Self-Care for the Age of Ultra-Anxiety is the title. And basically, they went out into the environment and tried to protect them from everything they could possibly think of. So for example, she's ready for a flood with her inner tube. She doesn't want people to get too close, so she put these thorns on her pants. They have cameras and mirrors looking behind them. Their faces are covered. And this, you can see, is made right about the time of COVID. So it's very much a response to that anxiety that I think a lot of us were feeling at that moment. And all, those, all the different possibilities, if one were to take them to an extreme. Also, as a performance piece, you know, it's just kind of wonderful to imagine them walking through the streets of New York and interacting with people. So here we have Marilyn Minter's video Smash, which was originally made for the Brooklyn Museum. So it's really great to have it here in, in uh, Reading. And basically, the, the, we were instructed it had to be projected. It had to be in its own room. And we had to have the audio with serious bass. <laughs> so that's what we did. 
thanks to Rich and David for making all that possible. And basically, she, she has always been someone who was pushing at the boundaries. In the 80s, she did this series of work based on pornography from the point of view of a woman, and it was rejected. And she was kind of shunned uh, afterwards. But then she kept coming back with more work, and her work is really spectacular, right? It's, this is enamel paint on aluminum, and these are big, beautiful paintings. And she deals with sensuality, but in a way that's very visceral, and I'm not sure how attractive it is, right? Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. And I think that's the power of it. It really hits that nerve for a person individually as opposed to something that you might see in the media that's supposed to uh, be attractive to as many people as possible. But here, inside the room, first of all, she's addressing the idea that women are breaking through finally, right? And she's literally has these, this woman in high heels br shattering glass, so you have to go see that. It's quite spectacular. And there's this sort of liquid silver splashing material all around. And the way I sort, I sort of connected it to this strange uh, Gene Kelly singing in the rain, except it's silver and it's splashing. Or maybe uh, for those of us who are like really into art and art history, Richard Serra throwing the lead into the corner. So it's this really interesting sort of o overlap of all these different things, uh, but definitely from her very specific point of view. So now we're up to Jennifer Markowitz, and she, she is also really courageous in putting out her sort of personal experiences. And she's done these incredible, almost diary-like embroidered pieces with a lot of sort of personal details and experiences. And it's something very cathartic, I'm sure. But also, I'm sure people connect somehow, right? Maybe there's a shared experience there that other people maybe wouldn't talk about. So it's nice when somebody puts it out there and you can have that conversation. And this is the piece when I was sort of looking for artists, this is the piece that I encountered. And I thought, well, this is perfect because we all just lived through COVID and the shutdown and that whole experience. And here she takes a silk organza, which is so delicate. And she hand embroiders, so there's a tremendous amount of labor, even in this little mask, to create, in this case, her check. She recreated her check that the government sent her during the COVID lockdown. And it's this great connection of different aspects that we all can identify with, right, having just been there. Uh, other things that she's addressed here is, this is the January 6, 2021, so, and that gives you a sense of the amazing detail in the, in the work. And if you look at this, it is a map of the Capitol, and these little red dots are like cell phone signals that were picked up. So there's this nice kind of connection of technology and something really handcrafted. And then finally here, we have her ballot on the right. So she's, and you'll see that downstairs, she's embroidered the actual ballot that she used for voting. And it's tattered and there's like, there are all these questions that are raised about the stability between the ballot and the January 6th and this, right? And all those anxieties that they generate. Now this is Alex Golden's work. And this work is based on the Iraq war. And you may recall from that moment on the right when Iraq voted for the first time, right? And some of the people, uh, some of the politicians to show their allegiance dyed their fingers blue and raised it 
raise their finger to show that, yes, Iraq is voting. And what Alex Golden did is this is a photographic image, and then the hand to the right is his own hand, and he inserts himself into these paintings. So that, is, uh, that's a, that part is painted over the photograph. And he was not entirely sure of our presence in Iraq, so he didn't actually paint his finger blue in that case. So he's kind of questioning that whole moment. And then over here, we have the Alvin Ailey and Robert Reed pieces. And these are really, um, I think, really profound. Uh, they're digitally drawn with a stylus. They are hand done on the computer. And this image of Robert Reed as a child shows the incredible detail that and time that went into their execution. Now, what they have in common and other people from this series is they all succumbed to the AIDS epidemic during the 80s or, or soon after. And also, their younger version of these artists. So we have uh, Alvin Ailey in what may be like a high school photograph of his, and then Robert Reed dressed up for maybe something like his school photograph. And what Alex Golden does is he captures these people uh, at that moment when their dreams were sort of taking shape. And then there's this hindsight that we have when we see these and when we see their image with the ch and knowing their future. Now, some of you may, I'm sure most of you know who Robert Reed is. He was the father from the Brady Bunch. And Alvin Ailey is one of our great choreographers, just magnificent from the 20th century. And now it's hard to imagine, but that AIDS epidemic was incredibly difficult, incredibly difficult. Up until 1985, 90.5% of the people uh, succumbed to AIDS, if they caught it. So it was, it was and it was, a, it was a painful and difficult way to go. So, and it hit the whole world, and it's still, internationally, it's still a very serious issue. But here, uh, we do have some medicines which which will help us here, but it's still very real in the rest of the world. And this just kind of, I think, honors these people and their talent and recalls that very painful moment in our history. Then here we have Sen Quan Chi, and he is a, a self-described ambiguous ambassador. So he is dressed in his Chairman Mao suit, which Chairman Mao made famous. He didn't actually like design it. The suit's a little earlier than that. But he, he goes to, as I mentioned before, these iconic places and photographs himself in this sort of tongue-in-cheek way uh, in front of these, here, the Golden Gate Bridge, the Leaning Tower of Pisa. And then some of his later pieces he started to go out into nature, but he always maintained this persona of the ambi ambiguous ambassador. And you may be wondering, he often has a fist, that's the shutter release on his camera. <laughs> so you can see that in, in these two images. And on his badge, and he used to go to like these very exclusive metropolitan openings and, and and he would dress like, and they would just let him in because he looked so official. But if they looked closely at the badge, it says slut for art. <laughs> so I love his whimsy and his, and his, just the persona and the character and those dark glasses and that uniform, uh, just being present as a tourist, right? So there's something really spectacular about that. Here we have Susan Kreil, and we saw her work maybe before when she re reflected on Abu Ghraib down here. But she also did these incredible pieces of the oil fields being burned in Iraq. And then she did a series uh, on 9-11. And 
it should be noted that uh, 2,996 souls were lost on that day. So it's, a, again, a really important and uh, difficult day. She is fearless in taking on issues, right? Issues that a lot of people would steer clear of. She goes right at it. And that 9-11 series is incredibly powerful. Now, most of these images came from the media. So you can see kind of like that's a drawing. The, that reflection is like drawn into the piece because it references a camera, right? And then Judith Shea just lives a few blocks from uh, the World Trade Center. And she explained to me once that uh, after those towers fell, there was this film of gray dust ever, on every single surface in her loft. And like if you picked up a cup, the dust would be under the cup. It was just everywhere. So she was very much there at that moment. And so she took this notion of the mannequins in the Brooks Brothers windows that was nearby looking up because that was one thing that she remembered from that day is everybody's head was, they were, everyone was looking up. And so she did a series here where everyone was looking up. And so you can see this suite of images that kind of bring together that day. And that's what I have. So. All right. Are there any questions? I know it's, is it five-ish? Yeah, it's right on the nose. So there's, if, does anybody have a question or thought? Okay. Yeah. All right. It took a lot of time. It took a lot of time. And uh, reaching out to the artists, reaching out to their galleries, um, reaching out to estates. Um, but yeah, and some artists were just like, we have some pretty um, established artists like Willie Cole, and he just was open to it. And Marilyn Minter was totally open to it. So uh, yeah, it was just a matter of reaching out and presenting my idea. And I think if they saw their work aligned with the concept of the exhibition, they were receptive to it. Any other questions? Yeah. So I work closely with you, and I know that you put a lot of thought into who should be in the show. Mm -hmm. um, but in curation, sometimes you're limited by your budget or time or whatever. Mm -hmm. If you have had those limitations, is there an artist or was there a concept that you wish you could have explored more? And if so, who would have been the artist that you would love to have had? Oh, that's a tough one. Gosh. Because <laughs> um, I feel like I could have asked than any number of artists. Um, and there were some artists that I, I just didn't have space for that I considered and would love to have included. Um, Gordon Mata Clark, is he the one who split the house? Yeah, I love that split house. <laughs> so that might be a piece I would like to include. Yes. <laughs> Yeah. Anybody else? Yes. What was the name of the person who made the poem about the dinosaurs? Catherine Lee. Yes. All right. All right. Okay. All right. So you can ask your questions downstairs with Matt if you have another question. Okay. Is that good? Yes, absolutely. I'll be down there, and there's lots of snacks if, if anyone yeah, wants a drink. Yeah. yeah. Okay.
All right, cool. Thank you. Thank you.